really get me up out of my seat or anything. It was uh, it was good watching, but it really like wasn't. It didn't feel like it was a pay per view match to me. No, uh, certainly didn't. It was it was a good match, but nothing uh, nothing crazy there. So yeah, Finn Balor um, retaining his title. Now next up, Matt, uh, last year's. Of course, uh, Mr. Wrestling himself, uh, you know, the man, the best in the world, Shane McMahon is that, Matt. And he's, uh, he came out with Drew McIntyre and uh, up against our boy Roman Reigns, the homeboy Roman Reigns on this podcast. Um, you know, what, what do I feel about Roman in this position? It's not a bad thing because I feel like most times he's always at the top and it's nice to see him doing something else. But uh, Shane McMahon, I mean, I am sort of at my end's wits with this whole Shane business now and him getting in good offense against wrestlers. And as good as Shane is, I kind of feel like, you know... In fact, we had an email, and uh, I'll read this one out now because it, it kind of makes sense of what we're going to talk about and what I wanted to put across here. But it's from um, uh, Christy Davis, who said, um, Watching Shane McMahon as much as I have done in the last two years, who would you say is the better performer, him or his dad? Um, and it's a very interesting thing because the most athletic one out of the two, by miles, the most daring one, is definitely his son. But at the same time, I kind of feel like Vince McMahon, the character, Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan, uh, all those other guys, he's Shawn Michaels, Brett, those guys he feuded with, what made that character amazing is that he wanted to see his, get his ass kicked. Um, and there was that big anticipation for it. Like a, a Steve Austin stunner was huge. Um, with Shane McMahon, I'm like, dude, it's like a playground all of a sudden for him. It's like he's got carte blanche and he's just going to take advantage of it. Um, now, I'm not suggesting Shane has that sort of ego to go, like, I'm going to go over on you, you, you. I don't think he's actually genuinely like that. But I kind of feel like there's nobody to sort of say, hang on a minute. <laughs> Let's slow it down a bit. Um, it, it's almost like he's an active wrestler now, Matt. I mean, he's he's an active wrestler working a Brock Lesnar schedule almost um, at the moment. What, what do you make of this and having him around? And, of course, going over again, um, I'm sure it's going to combinate somewhere. It's gonna, somebody will get that steam. But I'm, I'm not sure how much good it does uh, getting the steam from Shane McMahon. Uh, that That's the problem with it. But what do you make of this uh, whole thing, Matt, with uh, Shane and well, Roman? I, you know, I kind of feel like you might have an idea of where my feelings <laughs> lie towards yeah. this. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you invest so much time in a character like Roman Reigns and you want him to be, you want him to, they call it the big dog, you know, they say it's his yard. They want him to make it look like he's the toughest of the wrestlers that are in the WWE. And then, they have him against Shane McMahon. Um, and they have him... It, the commentary in this match, just like the previous one, mm, terrible. Yeah. They were saying, oh, what's Roman got left in the tank? Oh, he's struggling. <laughs> we saw this guy lying in the pool with his bone blood and still getting up versus Brock Lesnar. So come on, like Shane McMahon. He's destroying him, dismantling him, or taking him apart. He's incredibly ridiculous to believe. Yeah. Um, I feel like the star of this match was Drew McIntyre because he mm. didn't up getting that ring pretty quick and, yeah. and capitalised that situation. So that was the perfect timing by him. But, you know, everything else in this was pretty terrible. Mm. Um, I, I didn't enjoy any of it. And in a time in wrestling, when you're looking and you're thinking, OK, this is the first time in a long time when we have some real competition out there, really need to step our game up. What storylines have you got for us? How about we take your supposedly biggest star, Roman Reigns, to have invited Shane McMahon? You know, whoever's yeah. throwing that idea out in the board meetings need firing. Mm, yeah, it was, uh, it was a shambles. Uh, yeah, so I didn't enjoy it at all. And um, yeah, I just feel like if you look at Vince McMahon's track record in terms of his win loss, he I don't think he won any pay per view going. I think he won a lot of some Raws in there. And we know he won a Royal Rumble once. But in terms of like his win-losses, he lost most of them. All his WrestleMania matches, I don't think he's won any of them. Including against his own son as well, uh, Shane McMahon. So, there you go on that one. Um, anyway, next up, uh, Matt. And, and this leads to another question now. This is from DX1. Um, guys, what do you think about Lars Sullivan... 
This same uh, old stick happens every time. Last time we saw this was with the likes of Nia Jax and Braun Strowman. I hate it. Why does WWE keep going to this squash match stuff? Um, so, yeah, you saw Matt Lars Sullivan, and of course he was involved in a handicap match against the Lucha House Party in this one. But, you know, I was thinking about this question, and I think as much as I, you know, I do uh, criticise WWE for sort of not doing new things and stuff like that, to be honest... Um, this formula, and I have seen it thousands of times, you, you could go all the way back to King Kong Bundy, you know, when they used to make monsters for Hogan to wrestle back in the day, even Zeus, um, those, the, the you know, Sid, those type of wrestlers, the formula, believe it or not, it, it is effective, it does work, but the problem is, in this day and age especially, is that look where Braun Strowman is now. Look where, you know, Nia Jax is at the moment. You know, they don't do a very good job at keeping anybody at the top. I mean, Ryback, you know, you know hardly done it for him in the end. Um, now, probably the last successful time I actually saw this work out well, and it still didn't get him a title or anything, but he was a, a credible name. It was probably Umaga, um, and that's going back some time now. But he had that, that whole, I think he was unbeaten uh, for like almost a year and then he got like a big title match up against um, Cena or something like that. Um, and, and that, you know, that's where you want to get them. That is the, the reason you do this. But uh, the good thing with Umaga is they still kept him like a, a monster afterwards. They didn't just sort of destroy him like Rusev and other guys that have come before that. Um, so I do feel like the, there, is a, there is a method um, to this. And I do feel like it is effective. But um, the problem is, Matt, like Lars Sullivan, he could go through, you know, a year's worth of this, which is fine because, you know, it's just basically enhancing him and you just go up against guys that are just going to throw themselves around for you. But the problem is, is what do they do with Lars Sullivan once he's got the big payoff? Because there's always that big match and then you either go up or down and then it's all over with again and you sort of... In that mid-tier doing nothing uh, like the likes of Rusev and, and everybody else at the moment. So um, what do you think about Lars Sullivan, Matt? Is, it, is his potential coming out at you on the page? Or, uh, you know, is, is this, uh, this going to wind up being just another monster created for a guy like Roman Reigns to eat uh, and then it's done? He's got more potential than some of the other monsters that are currently floating around mm-hmm. in that locker room. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's quite good on the mic, I'll say. He, he knows how to carry himself that way and, you know, definitely physically imposing and mm-hmm. a scary-looking guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, the physical side of him is, is very impressive. Uh, it's, I'm just more worried about what he's like outside of the room <laughs> and, and the way he conducts himself and the things that he finds mm-hmm. appropriate to say. Yeah. If that Twitter account. Don't want to punish him for the things that he's saying, mm-hmm. then that could be a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, unless he finds a way to sort of conduct himself better and, and stick more to his character in his personal life, then uh, he's gonna find it difficult. But I feel like if, if it was to wipe the slate clean and he got a pass and everything that he said in the past, and, and he works hard enough, I feel like he could be quite successful within the WWE. Yeah, it'll be uh, fascinating. What, what did you make of this out in Matt? They did the the whole handicap squash business here, and um, yeah, what, what did you make of it? It, it didn't really work for me because yeah, there, there was the three on one aspect to it, and you know you're supposed to believe that that's almost leveling the playing field. Mm-hmm. But when the good guys result in getting themselves disqualified, that's always you know a major blowout for the match for me because that's sort of what a bad guy would do, you know, or the heel character. Mm-hmm. It's not. It never really goes off well when the when the uh, the people you're supposed to be rooting for get themselves disqualified. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. Uh, next up, it's uh, it's Randy Orton up against Triple H on a bike again. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, he got the entrance in, got that 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 bike out again, a quad bike, and you know ran that down. Likes that now, doesn't he, Matt? That's uh, that's definitely sticking with him. That that gimmick for now. Um, so yeah, it was another outing for Triple H, um, and um, up against Randy Orton in this one. What did you make of this match, Matt? We've got mixed opinions on this one. Some people loved it. Some people absolutely hated it, but. Um, yeah, it was it was a long match. I mean, it went like twenty five minutes, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, Triple H, last time we saw him was against another ex-Evolution guy, which was Batista. Now he's up against Randy. does seem like this is your life at the moment for Triple H. Um, every time we see him, uh, it's either like DX reunions or, you know, it, it, there's always something, isn't there, Matt? But uh, I don't know. Um, I, I do think Triple H is always going to be one of my favourites, but, like, the more I see him in these positions, I'm like, is he just... Is this just here and he's just surrounded himself with the guys he you know, prefers and likes the most? Or is there better ways of using Triple H to put over some of the other guys that you know, aren't Randy Orton and Batista and these, these other guys that are around, you know, that have already pretty much are going to get as far as they're going to go? Uh, what, what did you make of this one, Matt? Was this just a sort of a placement match, just sort of a, a big exhibition type match, this one? Yeah, it's, it's difficult when you think about how this one came together because I'm sure Triple H had grand designs for this and he probably thought this would be amazing. But at the same time, when he selects his opponents, like you said, it is going to who he knows, who he trusts, and also who he wants to give a big fat paycheck to, isn't it? Um, no doubt Randy was like compensated well for this match and you know Triple H himself likewise. And... It just seems like a massive ego boost for these two guys, like they sort of pat each other on the back, and um, I, I, it didn't really pay off for me. I, I didn't really see how it should have been drawn out this long, and the false finishes were, you know, very obvious. You know, you knew they weren't going to get the pins when they went for those kind of finishing manoeuvres. Um, I mean, yeah, they can work a physical match, and you know, under some other circumstances, it might have worked out well if it was a little bit shorter. Um, I just feel almost in a way now that when they came together, Randy Orton sort of exposed Triple H a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the first time, like, I was seeing Triple H kind of hitting that milestone where you're seeing that he's at a certain age now. And when Randy's getting up ready for the RKO, but Triple H isn't on his feet, you can see that slight hesitation. You know, it kind of throws me out at the moment. Mm, yeah, and no, I think I'm with you there. But uh, yeah, uh, Randy going over was the right decision at the end I felt like that's the main thing that come out of it because you know he's going to be around a lot more um and you know I think there's I think there's a Randy Orton um you know feud down the road with with maybe Roman again somewhere but uh, so they, they need him on a good good path there um next up what about this one Matt Bobby Lashley and Braun Strowman <laughs> The uh, after the feud to this has been a bloody nightmare with the whole tough man competition type stuff and who's who's stronger and all these things. Um, yeah, another interesting out in Braun Strowman going over seems to do well in Saudi Arabia, but um, I don't know. I they're just uh, it's it's almost like they've thrown these guys together because there's nothing too much else to do with either one of them at the moment, which is shocking. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. I mean, a guy like Bobby Lashley, you know, as much as they say how good this guy looks and every man wants to look like him, they they certainly in the WWE, they, they're not going to treat Bobby as a main event guy um, currently. And uh, I don't think at all at the moment. I can't see him ever getting back to where he once was. Do you think that Bobby is sort of that sort of in that middle zone there, Matt, between that level of sort of main event guy to sort of, he's always going to be like the best he's probably going to get is like a semi main event type competitor now yeah and that's quite unfortunate really mm. because he has all those tools to uh, to make it to the top mm. and uh, you feel like he should get there um, it's just when they have so much talent on the roster it's easy to get lost unless mm. you can find a way to reinvent yourself but he plays the same old character over Mm, and over again even when you think there's something different coming out like when he turns heel or face it's almost just like being exactly the same character that he always was yeah well uh yeah so Braun Strowman defeats him uh in under nine minutes um then we've got Kofi Kingston defending the WWE title up against uh Dolph Ziggler um Oh, man, I, I, this was okay, but like there was, I felt like what they wanted to get across was there. I just felt like the way they've, I think the way they're giving him, what I would like to see from Kofi is like before he gets to face guys like Dolph, which are good matchups. I think I'd rather see Kofi go over against somebody with a bit of a, a bigger name. 
um, to really establish